This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Sport of Pro Wrestling Podcast. I am Chris Sampsa, and this is your G1 Climax 30 Final Match Preview. I took a day or two off here because I wanted to give you all time to take a listen to my interview with Kevin Kelly, where we really focused in on the block finals and the block final scenarios and the block final events. Hopefully you enjoyed that. I've got to say thanks to Kevin again for joining me. I hope it's not the last time I get to talk to him on the pod here. So um, here I'm here just to talk about the G1 Climax 30 final match between Kota Ibushi and Sonata. Um, unfortunately we don't have a full card for this event yet, so this may be quick and this, you know, we may just be able to breeze through everything I've pulled together for this particular match. I'll give you a little bit of background to how they got here to catch you up if you, if you're running behind, but, um, overall, we're really just going to talk about this one match, the last match of G1 Climax 30. This way, if I if I preview this one match, I can say I previewed the entire dang tournament. Plus, I've got a ton of notes on this match. Obviously, with it being the final and with it being the only match for me to really dig in on, I've looked at every single angle I possibly could to um, try to provide a little bit of statistical or you know historical context around this particular match. The G1 Climax final event will come to us on October 18th, 2020 from Rio Goku Sumo Hall. The event will begin at 3 p.m. Japan Standard Time, which is 1 a.m. my time here in Chicago, 2 a.m. on the East Coast, 7 a.m. in London, and 7 p.m. in Auckland, New Zealand. They get the good time again. So um, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, kind of a typical Sunday start time in Tokyo. It's maybe a little bit earlier, um, but that's what we got. So the thing is, we don't have a full card for this event, so we've just got that main event match, the G1 Climax Final, the A block winner, Kota Ibushi, versus the B block winner, Sonata. So let's talk a little bit about how Kota Ibushi got here. So A block winner, Kota Ibushi, he got here via his victory over Tai Chi just the other night um, at Ryugoku Sumo Hall as well, and then a J White loss in the main event to Tomohiro Ishii. That's what passed Kota Ibushi through. So Kota Ibushi now is one of three wrestlers in the past 10 years, since 2010, to pass through to the finals without participating in the main event of his block. Um, of, of his block. So that is kind of an interesting nugget. Kota Ibushi kind of backing his way into the, um, the finals, but he did win outright 14 points, whereas the next highest was 12. No tiebreaker needed. Um, he was the only one at 14. So let's take a look at the core statistics, the just really the points of the A block. So Kota Ibushi landed at 14. Behind him, Will Ospreay, Jay White, and Kazuchika Okada landed at 12. Then, all the way down to 8 points, Jeff Cobb, Tomohiro Ishii, Taichi, and Shingo Takagi. And then behind them, Minoru Suzuki at 6, and Yujiro Takahashi landed himself one win. So he ended up at two. Now, I guess you you might be wondering how we break ties beyond the top of the block, and we we try to do it the same way as we would do it at the top of the block with head-to-head records. So of those three at 12, we've got Will Ospreay, Jay White, and Kazuchika Okada. Of those three wrestlers, Will Ospreay landed 2-0. He defeated both White and Okada. White ended up 1-1. He defeated just Okada, and Okada was 0-2 in the group. So that's how they order themselves out Um, beyond that we do the same as we head down now um jeff cobb tomohiro ishii and tai chi landed themselves at a 1-1 deadlock at eight points so we what we do there is we add up the points of the people that they defeated so jeff cobb had the had the highest quality of opponent followed by um tomohiro ishii followed by tai chi and Shingo Takagi was 0-3 against the other guys at 8 points, so he drops to the bottom of the list. Suzuki at 6, Takahashi at 2. So that's how we landed in the A block. 
Now over to the B block, champion Sonata at 12 points, tied at 12 with Evil and Tetsuya Naito, but he, he holds the tiebreakers over Evil and Naito, so Sonata moves on. Um, let's see, Evil at 12, Naito at 12, Evil breaks that tie by landing himself a victory over Naito earlier in the tournament, so Tetsuya Naito is actually the third place B block competitor. Uh, behind them, Kenta and Zack Sabre Jr., both at 10. Kenta defeated Zack Sabre Jr. Let's see here. We've got Hiroshi Tanahashi, Hiroki Goto, and Juice Robinson at 8. They were all 1-1, one one, also a three-way tie deadlocked at 8. So we had to add up their points. The opponents that Tanahashi defeated had 32 total points. Juice had 28, and Goto had 30. So the order comes out to Tanahashi, Goto, Juice Robinson, under them, Toriano at six points and Yoshihashi with four. So Sonata passes through based on those really good tiebreakers. That's why we always are looking at those those tiebreaker tables and, and being mindful of who beats who. Uh, the B block did turn out to be um, just kind of how we expected it. It was going to come down to who you beat versus how many. Uh, the A block, we kind of figured the same, but Kota Ibushi ends up passing through at 14 points to head on to his third straight G1 Climax Final. So let's dig in and talk about that G1 Climax Final. Like I said, I did my best to seek every single angle on this match, probably the one of the biggest matches that I end up um, previewing. So I did get to pull as many bits and pieces of information as I could, and I'm going to share them with you here. But first, let's talk about the venue, right? Ryogoku Sumo Hall. We're finally back in Ryogoku after two years away for the G1 Climax Finals. It, this will be the 27th G1 Climax Final to take place at Ryogoku. Only three uh, have taken place anywhere else. That's 2014 in the Cebu Dome and 2018 and 2019 in Nippon Budokan. Uh, 348 of the 1,527 all-time G1 Climax matches. Now, I'm excluding forfeits from this calculation because we're talking about actual matches. So, 348 of 1,527 have occurred at Ryogoku Sumo Hall. That's 22.8% of all G1 matches, the, obviously the most of any venue by a long shot. Um, there have been full tournaments that happened here, almost every single final. It is the venue for the G1 Climax. So, here we are at Ryugoku. We're going to have a main event of Kota Ibushi versus Sonata, and let's take a look at what the statistics and data points are giving us. Kota Ibushi, like I said, he's the first G1 Climax competitor to participate in three straight G1 Finals, and he looks to be just the third wrestler to win the G1 Climax two years in a row. Now, that's also happened in 1991 and 92. Those were the first two G1 Climaxes with Masahiro Chono. And then in 2003 and 2004, Hiroyoshi Tenzan won both of those in back-to-back -back years. Uh, Kota Ibushi, like I did mention, but I like to drill this one in. It's it's very interesting. I mean, he's just the third G1 Cli Climax finalist since 2010 who didn't participate in his block's main event on their last card. So it was Ibushi versus Taichi. They were second from the top. Jay White versus Ishii had that main event spot. And then Jay White lost, which passed through Kota Ibushi. So um, just really, you know, New Japan main events seem to be the more arduous uh, matches. I mean, even semi-main events, sure, but those main events. I and I wish I I wish I had pulled the data right. Um, the main events are definitely the longest, the hardest fought. Everyone wants that main event win, especially in Ryu Goku. It was a really big deal that Tomohiro Ishii was the winner in this match against Jay White, and it it, it was a it was a it was kind of Ishii's gold watch moment for the G1 because he's probably never going to win the G1. He may never go to a G1 Climax final, but man, he got that main event win at Ryu Goku Sumo Hall because he is always a G1 Climax MVP. So like I said, Kota Ibushi and Taichi, they were second from the top in that semi-main event, but Kota Ibushi's still going through. Kota Ibushi and Taichi's match was something to see. They decided they were just going to throw kicks. No fists, no punches, no holds, no grapples, just kicks e kicking each other until one of them literally couldn't stand. Ibushi landed 75 kicks against Taichi the other night, including his finisher, the Kamigoye. We'll call that a kick because it's with the legs, right? 
Ibushi took 83 kicks from Taichi in that same bout. So something to keep an eye on is Ibushi's legs. Does he have the legs to stand on to have a really hard fought, heavy battle in uh, this main event here? Now on to Sonata, right? Prior to this year's tournament, Sonata had only ever ended G1 tournaments with eight points. This year he finished with 12, so that's two wins better than ever before. Uh, Ibushi and Sonata ended with very similar totals in cumulative match length. Only three minutes and 12 seconds separate them across their nine block matches. Now, Ibushi took a really measured approach to this year's tournament. No matches lasting over 21 minutes and 56 seconds, and none shorter than 10 minutes and 43. So just an 11 minute and 13 second difference between his longest and shortest. Sonata, way more erratic, uh, especially at first. So he, he ranged from just 6 minutes and 16 seconds to the third longest block match with the decision rendered in G1 Climax history, his 28 minute and 25 second victory over Hiroshi Tanahashi. The difference between his high and low was 22 minutes and 9 seconds. So, and just that gap was 13 seconds longer than her, uh, Ibushi's longest match. Sonata really labored through his victories, and, and, and he lost quickly in the tournament, so his negative 9 minutes and 45 seconds win-loss differential is the worst in the tournament by over 6 minutes. Ibushi's 5 minute and 24 second win-loss differential is good for third best in the tournament behind just Zack Sabre Jr. and Yoshihashi. Yoshihashi, uh, the benefactor of small sample size on, on the win side there. Sonata spent a tournament best 20 0.86% of his tournament match length in his losing matches this year. It took Sonata 2 hours, 3 minutes, and 35 seconds to win his 6 match, six matches, so that's second most in the tournament behind Tetsuya Naito. Uh, while he only spent just 32 minutes and 34 seconds in his losing matches, and that's second lowest in the tournament, higher only than Toriyano. So 20 percent of his time 21 percent of his time was spent in losing matches what does that make 79 percent of his time in the winning matches so his efforts are um, fruitful um, though potentially he took extra time to win right so Ibushi on the other hand he spent just 27.72 percent of his G1 match length in his losing matches, good for the second lowest in the tournament behind Sonata. So 73% of his effort in this tournament was on the winning side. Uh, Kota Ibushi's longest win in the tournament was, was all the way back at the beginning of the tournament, his 21 minute and 35 second victory over Kazuchika Okada. Since then, Ibushi has been efficient, maxing out at just 17 minutes with Taichi on their last block night. So Ibushi should come in. You would think he would come in fresh, but he just ruined his legs with that match with Tai Chi. So that's probably going to come into play here. Um, curious to see how that plays out for him. I think I mentioned earlier that Kota Ibushi is on a three-match winning streak. Well, Sonata figured something out after losing his first three. He's on a six-match winning streak. That's his longest winning streak ever in his NJPW career. Now, if we go look at their G1 Climax history, of course, Kota Ibushi's got a little bit more under his belt here. He's uh, 34 and 22 all time, while Sonata is 22 and 23. If we look at just the last five years, including this year, so since Sonata's been in the tournament, Ibushi's at 26 and 12. He's only been in four of those tournaments, but Sonata is at 22 and 23. So Sonata's looking to even out his um, 46 match G1 Climax history here. So um, after his victory over Taichi, Kota Ibushi is now 2 and 2 during the G1 in Ryugoku Sumo Hall. He's 9 and 5 overall in Ryugoku. Uh, Ibushi's victories in the storied building include a junior heavyweight title defense against Prince Devitt in 2011 and a successful defense of his right to challenge briefcase against Evil at last year's King of Pro, Pro Wrestling event. His losses include his first loss to Kazuchika Okada in 2013. Uh, that's when Ibushi was still mostly with DDT and, and also Ibushi's first ever IWGP heavyweight title match against AJ Styles was also in this building in 2015. Of course, Ibushi, not the winner in that. He's never held the IWGP heavyweight championship, at least not yet. Uh, after his victory over Evil the other night, 
Sonata is now 2 and 1 during the G1 at Ryugoku Sumo Hall. He's 4 and 6 overall at Ryugoku, which includes his time with All Japan Pro Wrestling, Wrestle 1, and TNA. His most notable match at Ryugoku prior to this weekend was his IWGP Heavyweight Championship loss to Kazuchika Okada at last year's King of Pro Wrestling event. Now, the G1 Climax Final is contested with no time limit, so uh, all the block matches were contested under 30-minute time limits, and the G1 Final is contested with no time limit, and there have been five G1 Climax Finals that have surpassed the 30-minute mark, including three of the last four. Kota Ibushi has participated in two of those matches, including the longest G1 match of all time, the 2018 Finals versus Hiroshi Tanahashi, which ended in exactly 35 minutes. Now, Ibushi was the loser in that match. Ibushi was the winner of last year's G1 Climax in a victory over Jay White in just 31 minutes and one second. I say just in 31 minutes and one second, so just a touch over that 30-minute time limit. So while we're looking at match time, Sonata's longest career victory occurred during last year's G1. That was his 29-minute and 47-second victory over Kazuchika Okada. His longest career loss was his 38-minute and 3-second loss to Kazuchika Okada at 2019's Wrestling Dontaku. Uh, Kota Ibushi's longest NJPW victory was that win over Jay White in last year's final. Uh, His longest victory in any match was in 2012 when he defeated Kenny Omega in DDT in 37 minutes and 26 seconds. Ibushi's longest career loss occurred on January 4th when he lost to Kazuchika Okada in 39 minutes and 16 seconds. So these guys aren't super marathon guys. I wouldn't be surprised if this match goes over 30 minutes, but I'd also be really kind of surprised if it goes uh, into into that 40 range or even breaks that record of 35 with Ibushi and Tanahashi from 2018. Sonata's 10 singles victories over the last six months, so 180 days, is the third most in New Japan behind only Evil and Okada. So Sonata kind of quietly having a really strong singles year. Uh, Ibushi's only singles matches over the last 90 days have occurred during the G1, but his 7-2 record earns him a 778 winning percentage, which is by far the best over that time period. Uh, Kota Ibushi has not been pinned or submitted outside of his singles matches in 2020. His only losing falls have come via his singles losses this calendar year. But when tag and multi-person matches are included, Sonata has the most winning falls in NJPW in 2020 with 25. Sonata also has the best fall differential, so that's winning falls minus losing falls, at plus 18. Head-to-head, Ibushi and Sonata, they've fought twice, both during the G1 the past two years. Um, Good, highly contested battles. Uh, First one was in 2018 when Sonata defeated Kota Ibushi in uh, Nagata, so Sonata's hometown. Big main event win. Looked like it was going to be Sonata's uh, path forward that was going to propel him. It didn't end up uh, turning out that way. And then last year during the G1, they met at Corican Hall, where uh, Kota Ibushi was victorious over Sonata in 19 minutes and 14 seconds. Um, so this is kind of the third match of another Kota Ibushi uh, 2018 to 2020 trilogy. Now, my pal Kevin Kelly, he said at the end of the broadcast last night, he said, thank goodness we get just a real wrestling match. We're not going to have a bunch of Bullet Club BS. We're not going to have a bunch of wacky stuff going on. We're going to just get a wrestling match between Sonata and Kota Ibushi. For the G1 Climax Championship, Sonata, his first final, his first time really being competitive in the G1 even, and Kota Ibushi is kind of the old guard. He's had three straight G1 Climax finals now, he's breaking a record, and he's got a shot to be something special and win his second in a row, and then potentially challenge for that uh, IWGP Heavyweight Championship against Tetsuya Naito, hopefully at Wrestle Kingdom. So that's kind of my whip around um, run through of everything that I got to pull for this particular match. If I had to be, if I'm a betting man, I'm betting on Kota Ibushi. And that's probably because he's got more experience in the G1 finals. 
Um, I think that Ibushi has very quietly had a really steady and efficient tournament, and I think that that sets him up, whereas Sonata really has labored through most of his victories. Now, that's honorable, and it does show that he can go along and survive, but I don't think that... I think Kota Ibushi, regardless of what happened with Taichi the other night, I think Kota Ibushi is going to come in with more energy. I think, and I think Kota Ibushi is equally motivated to win the G1 as he was last year when he won it for the first time. I think he's equally motivated to a, be that back to back. Like maybe that's his thing, but also to get another shot on a big stage for that IWGP heavyweight championship, hopefully at wrestle kingdom versus Tetsuya Naito in all likelihood, uh, kind of an old rival of his Sonata on the other hand, I don't see him being super motivated to take on his buddy Tetsuya Naito at Wrestle Kingdom. So even though he's already got an IWGP heavyweight championship match, he he at least has stake for one because he defeated Naito in the G1. And that's kind of a tradition that exists too. So if Sonata doesn't win, I would imagine that Naito is defending that title against Sonata at some point in the probably in the near future, potentially at Power Struggle or maybe the World Tag League Best of Super Juniors Finals. So um, there's an opportunity there for Sonata at hand. So I could see Sonata. I wouldn't say laying down, but I could see Sonata being a little less um, being a little less motivated than someone like Kota Ibushi, who's going to have a tough time squeaking himself into that IWGP Heavyweight Championship lane without a tournament victory. In regards to their in-ring performance, it's a toss-up. Sonata's got a lot of tools, and Ibushi's got a lot of energy usually. Uh, If Ibushi can keep this match at his pace, he'll win. Sonata's got, he's got the aerobics to, to keep up, but when Ibushi paces out a match, which he really has this entire G1, he's he's been kind of a chameleon working other people's styles and showing that he can win in those styles, but he's also been um really measured in his approach so if he can keep his head on straight and do that and not lose his cool i think abushi's the winner here again and i think he heads off with the briefcase now things to keep an eye out for on the rest of the card i would imagine we're going to see jay white and evil interact potentially for the first time since being back in japan Directly, at least. Like, we know that they've interacted in their backstage promos. That's what I'm keeping an eye out for. We did have the C-Block finish up with Yotasuji, the winner. So, curious to see how he's booked going forward. If he's booked with some deference. um, If he he gets some more opportunities than some of the other young Lions. And I'm also curious to see who else is in the country. We do have the Power Struggle Tour coming up soon. So, there would be reason enough for some of these guys to... Uh, get themselves over to Japan and uh, do their two week quarantine and then uh, get booked on get booked on the show. So I, I'm curious to see who's there and who's booked on the card. We, I, you know, you may that may be posted by the time this podcast hits your feeds. But either way, I, I don't have it right now and I don't have um, any extra inside information. Aside from that, got to be curious if Will Ospreay will add any other members to his new faction or if he will interact with Kazuchika Okada. And we'll get to see kind of how Okada reacts to Will Ospreay, um, you know, really betraying him when it comes down to it. So I think that that there's a lot of I think there's a lot of different um, pieces in the puzzle. The things things are coming together for where we're, we might be headed for Wrestle Kingdom and who's going to face who. I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be a hell of a ride over the next two and a half months or so. Um, the other thing to keep an eye out for is that Wrestle Kingdom announcement. So the Tokyo Dome show has not been officially announced yet, but I imagine that this may be the last chance for njpw to do that on a big stage so i would keep an eye out for that around that time of an intermission so don't step away that early so whoo we did it 
We went through the entire G1. We did audio for every single day, even though I bundled together the two days with Kevin Kelly, but that's a special event, right? So we did it. We did audio every day. We did written previews every day. This has been really fun. I've never had more fun with a G1 or a, uh, you know, even any sort of professional wrestling event. So I appreciate you coming along for the ride with me. I do plan on keeping up with the World Tag League and the Best of the Super Juniors Tournament. I'm not sure that I'll do audio every single day or for every single card, but it'll probably be quite a bit similar format, less than half an hour each time. We'll play catch up on either one or both of the tournaments and we'll go forward. It kind of depends on um, the scale of those tournaments. So if they're big and there's a lot of matches on each card, then I'm probably going to have to break them up. But if they're a little bit smaller, a little truncated, I think I might be able to just do podcasts for every other day and it'd be a catch up for both tournaments. So that's what's bouncing around in my brain right now. Not sure exactly what's that, what that's going to look like. Either way, you'll certainly be able to find all of my written content for that at sportofprowrestling.com. We'll put the big stuff over at voicesofwrestling.com too, as well as this podcast. I really appreciate you taking this ride with me. I've had a great time, and that's all I've got for you. But I will see you next time on the Sport of Pro Wrestling podcast.